okay? Or you find out that that uh, it took uh, uh, not it was not as fast as you wanted, or it didn't have certain features that you wanted. And so you have to go back and communicate with these people and go through this cycle many times before you come up with a, with a model and an application that can really be used in practice. Okay. And so the, the motivation of a modeling language is to be able to do this cycle quickly and reliably. And, and in particular, to get the results before this owner, your client, loses interest in the whole process. And what had happened in the early days of linear programming was not just that the algorithms were so slow, but it took so long. Remember, uh, in the previous talk, it was said that, that uh, you need one expert with many, many uh, talents to be able to, to do this. And it took so long to do it, but by the time you got any results, the, the client had decided that it really wasn't going to work. And, and, uh, and then, of course, at the end, you'd like to deploy this for application once you've gone around and gotten a model that works. And so the motivation for modeling languages was to make this reliable okay, so that it would support the optimization algorithms and get, get applications out. Okay. And uh, now, why did you need a modeling language for this purpose? Well, you have to recognize that optimization problems really have two very different forms to them. And the first form is the form that you think about it in, which I'll, I'll show one example of that, which is the algebraic form, which is, is a way of thinking about an optimization model that makes sense to a person. You could explain to somebody else in this form. You could understand and make changes and, and, and develop in this form. The form in which these fast algorithms want the problem is very different. Okay? It's things like lists of coefficients and sparse arrays of numbers and things like that. And you can't look at this form and formulate your model or understand it at all. In order to be able to solve, you have to go from how you understand it to how the algorithm understands it. Then you run this fast solver, and then you have to bring it back to your context in order to understand the results and know whether they're working. Okay? In the early days, a huge amount of work went into going back and forth between these two things, writing elaborate programs and so forth. And the idea of a modeling language was to have a form of this that could be read by the computer. So that you could write something that was sort of in the form that you thought of it, but you wrote it out in a way that the computer could read it and translate it into the form that was needed here, and then could translate the results back. So the idea was that, that you worked in something that still looked, even though it was computer readable, like something you could understand. And all this work that was done in, in writing elaborate programs to, to generate the form of the problem that the algorithm needed will be done automatically. So that's the idea behind it. And the advantage would be that you could do these modeling cycles much faster and also more reliably. So that it would get you going so that before the client lost interest, you would have some real results. And that's been the motivation of it since the first modeling languages were devised in the 19... Uh, 70s. And uh, now the, what's emerged is the most popular class of general modeling languages are what are called the algebraic modeling languages. And they're based on describing an optimization problem uh, in terms of uh, first you define various sets and parameters that describe your data, much the way as you would for a database. Then you define decision variables. Everyone those optimization problems have variables. Okay? And then you um, specify an objective function, and maximizing or minimizing some function of these, and various equations and inequalities that, do, that specify constraints. This is not the only way to specify an optimization problem. You could do it by drawing a graph or something like that. But, but this is very general, which is appealing. And it's also appealing because anybody who studied mathematics at the beginning of their course of studies is familiar with things like variables and equations. Okay? Also, it's very powerful. Any kind of problem, many different kinds of problems can be expressed this way, okay? with many different kinds of complications and special features. And the other thing is, people have implemented a number of modeling languages based on this. So they act, it actually works to, to use this paradigm of optimization. 
And in particular, I'm going to describe the, the language that, that I helped to develop, which is called the AMPL language, which is maybe a third generation modeling language. And uh, uh, it's algebraic, as I said. It reads data from a variety of sources. And uh, it can be used interactively when you're developing the model. And then you can, can uh, put what you've developed into various scripts so that you can run little programs. And I'll show you examples of that. And, uh, so it has, has this, uh, all these advantages of the algebraic languages that I mentioned previously. And it was designed to try to make it as close as we could to the mathematical language. As, as you always have to make compromises when you use a computer language instead of the language that people just use off their heads. Okay? And the idea was to make um, as few uh, compromises as we could so that it would be natural and appealing to use, and so you could get started quickly with it. Okay? And uh, so, of course, um, in order to make any language like this work, it has to be connected to solvers. So any of the popular languages have support for all of the popular solvers, like the Garobi one I'll use in these examples, and which was described in Professor Bixby's talk. But, but uh, this is what's called a general purpose modeling language in that it'll support a range of solvers, and you can pick the one that's most appropriate for your uses, okay? And it also detects a variety of problem types automatically. So if it has integer variables, then it uses the mixed integer programming. If it has nonlinear variables, it may use some nonlinear kind of solver. And it has access to all the options of all these algorithms. So if you want to speed it up by tuning some of the options, you have access to all of those through this language. Okay? So here's. That's sort of like my introduction to modeling languages in general. But let me show uh, a, sim a relatively simple example. And then, then in the case studies, I'll show some, some more complicated models. Um, so this, uh, uh, appropriate to a logistics conference, is a problem of multi-commodity transportation. So you have products available, you have products needed, and the idea is to plan the shipments at lowest cost. And, uh, in addition to those constraints, we have various practical restrictions. Okay? There's fixed costs, shipments have to be at least a certain size, factories cannot serve too many stores. Okay? So this is typical of many problems. There's sort of a basic part here. And, and then there are various practical complications, which are what make it really challenging. And now, because of these restrictions, you require a mixed integer solver. And that's why uh, they, they, those models are found so often. So um, here's how you could write it in math. You would say, well, there are really three sets of things, origins, destinations, which are the store, and products, and that underlie the entire model. And a good modeling language can handle these sets of things very um, effectively. There's also a lot of data. So this is a, a symbolic description of the data. I'm not showing you here any actual data values. What I'm showing you is what the data values have to look like. Okay? There has to be certain amounts available at the origin, certain amounts required at the destinations, limits on shipments, various kinds of costs, and certain parameters on the, the minimum shipment size and the maximum destination served by any origin. So when you make up an algebraic model, you describe all the data that's required. And now you can say, well, the variables in this case, there are only two kinds. The amounts of each product is shipped from each origin to each destination. And this 0, 1 variable that, that um, registers whether any shipments are made from a certain origin to a certain destination. And it's this kind of variable that requires a mixed integer solver. Now in terms of those, I can give you the objective function as a big linear sum that's the sum of the variable costs plus the fixed costs of shipping. And uh, the constraints, the, the, the constraints just on, on shipping, the, the transportation constraints, are that the shipments out of origin I must not exceed what's available, and the shipments into each destination must equal what's required. So, that's a fundamental kind of problem. But what ties all this together and makes it difficult are the, are the practical requirements. And those are the ones that, 
that require you to use those y variables that are 0 or 1. Okay? So there are three sets of those. Okay? One for the one that, that, that um, sort of defines the y variables and says that if, if, if this shipment variable isn't 1, then you can't ship anything. One that requires that the amount shipped, if you ship anything, is at least s. And one that says that the total shipments are bounded by this n. So it turns out I can write this all as a linear problem, but I have to have these additional variables here to write all of this. And if I add all these constraints into there, then I get a problem that models the entire problem I've shown you so far. Now, the idea of the ample language is that I can write this same model in computer-readable form. So the first thing I do is I write all the data. So here are the three sets. I've given them some more understandable names here. And, and here's a supply parameter. There's one for each origin and each product. And there's a limit for each origin and destination. Here are the costs. And here are those two parameters, the minimum load and the maximum number served. So this is the same thing that I showed on the other slide, just translated into an ordinary computer character set that can be read by a system. And the same goes for the rest of the model. I define two variables, the trans, that's the x, and these are the y's. Okay? And, and this, there's an x variable for each origin, destination, and product, and a y for each origin and destination. And then I can write the objective like this. And to, to show that this is the same thing as in my math, I've actually copied the mathematical one down here. And you can see that, that um, this had sum of i in origin, j in destination, p in product. There's exactly the same thing. Then it had variable cost ijp times shipment ijp. It's exactly what you have here. I've named things a little differently, but they're exactly the same. And similarly, this product here shows up here with exactly the same summation that I had there. So you don't have to translate this in the sense of putting it into a different way of thinking. You just have to change the, the notation that you're using. But the thought is exactly the same. It talks about the same thing. And the same holds true for the constraints. So here is one example of a constraint. This is the supply constraint. It was originally written like this in the mathematics. And notice this says, for all i in origin and p in product, the sum over all destinations of the transshipment ijp, that's exactly this sum, is less than or equal to the supply of p at i, which is exactly this. So again, I've taken the form of the math, and I've written something that says exactly the same thing using the same components. There are no new concepts in here. The form looks somewhat different, but there are no new concepts in there. It's the same thing. Now, if I write all five of the constraints, it looks like that. So that's the whole ample model. Each of these corresponds to one of the mathematical constraints, and it's the same inequality. Okay. And I don't have to change anything. If I want a variable, a sum of variables here is greater than or equal to something times a variable there, I just write it that way. It's up to the computer system to translate this into some form that the solver needs. Maybe it moves all the variables to the left. Okay? And uh, maybe it looks to see if, if uh, some of these um, variables, um, some of these things are zeros, and it throws those constraints out. But all that is done automatically. I just have to write it the way I think of it. Now, up to now, I've talked only about symbolic models. But of course, you need some data. So now you, 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 you gather some data. Here's a data set, a small one that I made just for uh, illustration. Your data could also be in a database or a spreadsheet. Here I've shown just a, a text form of it that, that the Ample system can read. And this shows all the, here are the sets, and here are various tables of data. And the variable costs take up a whole screen by themselves. And here are the fixed costs down here. And now I can tell Ample to read the model, read the data, and solve it. So that's what I do. I say, read this model, read that data file, set the solver to Garobi in this case, and solve, finds that solution. And I can say, well, I want to look at the use variables. Those are the y, 0, 1 variables. It shows me what those are. And now, interactively, you can now look through, once you've solved it, you can look through any any data involving this model that you want to try to figure out whether the solution makes sense. 
So here are like some examples of what you could look at. You could say, well, um, for each origin and destination, I'd like the total shipments over the limit to see like what percentage of the limit was used. Or I'd like to see for the maximum serve constraint, I'd like to see the <coughs> part involving the variables, which tells me how many were actually served from each one. Or I'd like to see the total cost and then just this, which is just the fixed cost. And so it shows me the total cost was that, and you see the fixed costs were, were a relatively small proportion of the total cost. And when you're trying to figure out whether you got a solution that was good, and if you didn't get one, what went wrong, okay, being able to, to interactively look at things in terms of your original model. So, you know, in terms of your original notation is very, very important. If you have to go keep writing programs to, to generate more information, it would slow you down considerably. And uh, now, what I described there is what's called a dense network. That is, there's a shipment link from every origin to every destination, and every product can, in principle, be shipped. Now, for big, for big logistics problems, it becomes impractical. Okay, I would need a variable. The number of variables would be number of origins times destinations times products. And if you added something like time periods, it would become very huge. And so you want to be able to say that, really, I just want to model the shipments that are possible and not all the shipments that could, could, in theory, be made, just the shipments that are possible in practice. And so what you can do in, in AMPO is to find a, a set of ship triples, I, J, P. This is the set of all triples such that you can actually ship product P from I to J that it's actually allowed in this solution. So all I have to do is say that there's a ship, a ship set which is within this set of triples. Now I'm also going to want to know what's the set of all pairs of cities from which anything can be shipped. Okay? What's the set of all IJ such that there's at least one product that I can ship from I to J? And that's very easy to write. I can just say that there's a set of links which is the set, I just take all of these triples and I extract the IJ pairs from all of them and put them together in a set. And that, that creates it for me. And, and the, the thing that you really need in a modeling language is the, a way to manipulate these sets. When you get to, to things like logistics problems where, where there are a lot of network components and a lot of these sparsities, if, if you can't manipulate these easily, you can't write a clear model because this is the way you think of it. Now once I do that, the rest of it is easy. So I, all my shipment variables are indexed over these ship triples. Okay? And all my use variables, which are, which are 0, 1 variables that, that correspond to IJ shipment pairs, are indexed over these, this link set. And then my objective is just the sum over all ship triples of the variable cost times that. This is exactly the same as before, except now instead of saying sum over i in origin, j in dest, p in prod, I just say the sum over all i, j, p triples in the ship set. So I can easily sparsify this. It doesn't require doing anything really conceptually a whole lot different. The models look much the same. And the same goes for the constraints. Whereas before, I would have written the supply constraint like this, which says for each origin and product, the sum over all destinations of the shipment can't be more than the supply. Now I would just write it like this. And, and all I'm saying is for each origin and product, the sum of all triples that have that origin and that product of the amount shipped has to be greater than or equal to that. So there's no big change here. This is called a slice through the set of triples. And I can use that idea in every single, in every single constraint. So here are my five constraints from before, and the red shows the only things I've changed. And so now I have a, a, a sparse shipment one, and, and any large practical logistics problem is going to have some of these sparse, sparse sets in it. That's sort of, and here I only have a network of origins and destinations, but a real network has, you know, nodes, shipment nodes all spread out. And that's really important to only include the, the pairs that, that represent actual shipment. Okay. Now, 
So here, um, here are two data sets. You see they're not quite the same. And if I want to try different possibilities to see what the differences are, I can just say, well, I read the first data set and solve, and then I reset the data and read the second one and solve. And notice when I read the second set of data, I don't have to change the model or even tell the AMPLE system that anything's different except that I read new data. It automatically puts that new data in place of the original data and generates a new model. And so that link set, for example, the link set was a function of the data that's automatically recomputed. And uh, so, so all that is taken care of behind the scenes. And this is sort of the declarative nature of algebraic modeling languages, that once I define the model, that definition always holds. If I change the data, then, then that definition is automatically applied to the new data. And I can just solve with it. So I find out that this restriction on the shipments is not quite as expensive as that one. Okay. And uh, now the other thing I said I would mention is, is scripting. Once, once you uh, have the model working, you want to try some experiments with it. And they often involve doing things repeatedly or doing certain schemes of optimization. So this shows, for example, where I take that maximum city served and I started at seven and I, I do this loop where I reduce it to six and to five and to so forth. So forth. See, m goes from seven to one by minus one. I let the maximum serve equals m and solve. And then I check, and if it's infeasible, then I break out. Otherwise, I display the max serve and the number serve. And if I run that, you see I get that it runs Kurobi three times, one with max serve equals seven, and then again with six, and then with five, and then it's infeasible. And you see that um, here it, it uses, it serves six from here, and so in fact, this is the one that makes a difference. But you can't get it any smaller than that. You have to serve some with five. And so uh, this sort of looping construct that exists in here uh, makes it possible, loops and ifs make it possible to, to do these kinds of things. Okay? And it's, it's completely integrated with the modeling language. There's not a separate language for writing, writing these scripts. It uses the same ideas of, of sets of things and assignments of values to parameters in the model and so forth, okay? and, and so solves within the loop. So, and I'll show one other script. This one's a little more complicated. This one is to find the n best solutions in terms of which links are used. So when you, when you solve this the first time, it tells you which links to use and which links not to use to get the best result. There's a fixed cost, so you don't want to use too many links. So what this has is it has one extra constraint that I've defined, and, and uh, for each solution that's found, Okay, that's the end solve for each previous solution. It defines this constraint, and without going into too much detail, what this constraint is saying is that the next solution it gives me much differ from the previous solutions in at least one of those variables. Okay, so it can't be the same. So it has to give me the next best solution. Now, initially, the number of solutions is zero, so actually none of these are defined. The first time I solve, none of them are. But after I solve, it steps the number of solutions by one, and it set, this is the set of all links that were actually used, which figures in here, and then it goes and does it again. So what's happening is, every time it finds a new solution, it's automatically adding a new constraint here. But, but you don't see anywhere here that I actually say add a constraint. All I do is I increase this indexing set by one, and I provide the data in the constraint, and it's automatically there's another constraint there. So, so very cleanly I can describe this process. And if I describe it that way, then when I solve it, I just include this script, and you see that it solved it the first time, here's the ones that were used, and that was my original solution. The second time it uses slightly different links, and it cost me a little more, and the third time, it also uses different links, and it costs a little more. And so you can get, you could run this easily and get the best 10 or something like that. And it would give you an idea which links always have to be used and which links are not so important. And also give you an idea of some of your alternatives. Okay. So, so that's my introductory example.
okay, with a fairly simple model and gives you an idea of what a modeling language does for you in terms of thinking about the model and doing things with it in terms of the way you think of it. Okay? And always, you know, somewhere in here, there's a solve. So we, we make use of all that great software technology. Now, who, who uses these modeling languages? They, they have been adopted by people who use optimization for a very large number of purposes. So I'm going to show some customer areas on the next slide. And, and then what I'm going to do is to show two examples that, that are case studies. And there I'll, I will show the mathematical formulations, which now you know can be easily translated into, into AMPLE. And, uh, and, and give an idea of what it was, you know, why it was that they wanted to use this modeling language, as opposed to, to just skipping it and writing some program to generate the, uh, the problems for the solver. Okay? And, uh, and then I'll say something briefly about, about uh, users in government and, and academic use as well, where it's widely used, and a bit about the future. So um, among the areas of a, a, a big area for use of these things is transportation. So uh, the ample language alone is used by uh, one of the three largest uh, uh, airlines in the, in the US extensively, uh, and one of the largest trucking companies as well, as well as by a large railroad. And uh, so uh, it's an obvious choice for transportation where often much of the business consists of operations and, and, and reducing costs. So um, all the airlines have about equal ability to fly airplanes, and the real question is how can they do it, uh, the operations efficiently. And uh, the, uh, there's a lot of use in production, uh, both at the planning and at the, at the uh, distribution stage. So uh, we have users in, for example, steel and automotive, who are using it for, for deciding what to produce. But, but uh, there's a lot of supply chain application here, too. And my two case studies are going to come from, from this supply chain kind of application. In fact, uh, you can't really separate production from, from distribution as far as trying to minimize your costs. And the only reason it was ever done was that it was too hard to minimize them together. So now people try to minimize these things together. I'll just say that another big area is finance. Uh, so. Uh, a number of kinds of financial companies uh, find they have optimization problems increasingly are building models for these things. Uh, and another big one is, is natural resources. Uh, you heard Professor Bixby talk about electric power. And uh, another big use for AMPO is, is gas distribution networks, which are uh, uh, much more complicated than you would think. You can't just sort of uh, uh, send gas the same way you can send trucks full of things. They, there has to be some compressors that sort of up, uh, raise the pressure at certain points, and there are all sorts of economic issues and how it's sold and so forth. So these are actually quite complex models. And uh, we also see a lot of uh, application in, in, in mining businesses. Okay. Uh, there are also a, a number of users now in information technology. And, uh, and consulting practices now make it a point of having uh, some ability to do modeling with, with, with modeling languages because they are, the ones, they are the ones who go out and try to find new clients for these things. And they have to show results before the client loses interest. So we have a number of customers who ample, for Ample that are actually uh, 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 consultants themselves. Now, our role as, in developing Ample was to develop this software so other people could use it. And as a result, most of our clients, if you ask me, I couldn't tell you very specifically what they do with it. That is, I, I can tell you that it's used by this very large airline, but I can't show you any of their models because they've never let anybody look at them. And maybe that's because they have competitors and they don't really want them to see what models they're using. Okay? And, uh, and, and so a lot of them, uh, they sort of take them and run with them and they don't come to us too much for advice, except they run into some very specific technical problem occasionally. Okay? And uh, I think that's in part proved the success of these languages, because if, if nobody could use it without a lot of help personally from me, there wouldn't be many users. 
I can only get around to help so many people. Okay? But because a, a user can take it, and they can use it on themselves just reading our materials, and the book we wrote showing how to use it, and, and take it and build very large systems okay, using the, their own people and their own experts, uh, has made it possible for this idea to spread greatly beyond, beyond just the developers. Okay. Now, however, there's an exception that, that there is, as uh, was mentioned, this, this uh, Edelman Award. And the Edelman Award tries to tease people into showing their results. And, and the, 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 the incentive for showing what your models to the world, your applications to the world, is that you may win this big prize. Okay, you may become a finalist like the two I'll show, or you may be the winner among the six finalists. And this has succeeded in bringing to light what people have actually done with some very interesting optimization applications. Okay? And so uh, these two uh, finalists uh, specifically said that they used ample models. And so I took a closer look at them. And they didn't actually give me their ample models which they probably considered to be proprietary, but they were willing to give the mathematical descriptions of their problems, at least one problem each, in a paper that they wrote. It's part of, if you want to be a finalist in the Edelman Prize, you have to agree to write a paper describing some of what you did. And uh, so they described at least something, and so we can have a look at what they did. And their paper also describes what went along with that. So um, one of them is Zara, which is a clothing Retailer. So they have uh, stores selling clothing of varying kinds all around the world. Okay? There's one within, I don't know, 15 minutes drive of my house, but they actually started in Spain. So it, it's really an international uh, company. And the way they described it, this is the way they used to describe how to, what, what things to send from the warehouse to the different stores. Okay? The retailing of clothing is notorious for the fact that some things sell much faster than others. And it's very hard to get the right assortment of clothing into the store so that people come, they find what they want to buy. And uh, the original process knows here's the decision points. This decision was made by store managers. This decision was made by the warehouse allocation team, which is a team of people. What they proposed to go to was a process where this decision was made by a forecasting model, and this decision was made by an optimization model. And what was that optimization model doing? Okay. Uh, it was a, essentially a, a model with piecewise linear functions that were turned into linear functions, you'll see, and uh, with integer variables that was run once for every product every week. So this is something that had to be run many times. And uh, it would decide how much of each size to ship to each store. So each piece of clothing comes in a range of sizes. And you had to decide how much of each size of this to ship to each store. And this was dependent on part on how many of each size were currently in the store, and partly on how many you had in the warehouse, and partly on how many you thought you could sell. And uh, they, they, they reported in this paper that, that the use of this approach rather than this increased sales by three to four percent, which might not sound so so huge until you realize that the profit margins are very thin in, in uh, retailing, and, and several percent can make a very large difference to the profit of the company, okay? even though it, it, it doesn't seem that it increased the sales by very much. Okay? This is actually, the profit's only this big, so increasing the sales makes a big difference in the profit. So what's their formulation behind this that they reported? Okay? Basically, there were just two sets, a set of sizes, okay, which turned out there are major sizes and regular sizes. Okay? And it turned out that major sizes are the ones most people buy. If a store ran out of major sizes, they took that clothing off the floor and they didn't really sell any. And there's a set of stores that you might need to ship to. And there's all this data. Okay? There's various inventories at the warehouse and the store, selling prices, uh, and this, this factor that, that uh, weights the value of the inventory shipment, I'll describe that later, and there's a, a demand rate and, uh, for, for each size in each store that gives you an idea of the demand, 
And there's this set, which again will come up later. There's more data than you might think involved in this. But let me show the model that they had to deal with. The basic model, like my other one, has two kinds of variables. There's an integer variable, how many of each size to ship to each store. Remember, this is one product. So in some cases, you may only ship three of a certain size. Okay? This is not something where you want the solution to come out two and a half. And then there's the, the approximate expected sales across all sizes in each store. Okay? And the sales, okay, that, that it's OK if, if that's fractional, as it turns out. And uh, the objective is simply the expected revenues from the sales okay, plus some estimate of the value of what wasn't shipped. Okay? This makes life more complicated because essentially what's left in the warehouse, you have to worry about what that would be worth if you didn't ship it and waited. Okay? Otherwise, you're, you're, uh, you're distorting your optimization. Okay? So this is the, the total value of everything. And they can, they can experiment with this parameter which weights this more or less. Now, if that were the whole model, uh, first of all, z wouldn't be related to x. And it would be quite simple. But what really made this model difficult was trying to relate expected sales to shipment quantity. If you send a certain amount to the stores, what sales can you expect? Okay? Given, and that depends on what mixture of sizes you're going to have of the two kinds of sizes. Okay? when you ship it. And it turns out they needed, um, so they needed all the following constraints. This one is simple. This just says that the total shipments can't exceed what's in the warehouse. But all the other constraints have to do with the relationship between sales and store inventory. And this was really where all the work was, was to figure out what the form of these constraints should be to properly relate by linear constraints the shipments and the, the sales and the store inventory. So how relate what you're going, you think you're going to sell to what you ship. And if you can't make some estimate of that, then you can't really optimize. Okay? Now you can imagine that when all of this can be translated directly into AMPL. So they, they essentially could take anything like this and just